Hello, thank you for joining me for this presentation. It's the 16th of May. It's coming up quite close now to the start of the Blackboard European Teaching and Learning Conference. And who would have thought that we'd be doing it in this way? And uh, today I'm going to be showing you or taking you through a presentation called The Bluffer's Guide to Blackboard Theme Accessibility. My name's Matthew Deeprose, and I'm the VLE manager at the University of Southampton. Now, to take you through the agenda for today, I'm going to go through four main topics, and I've listed them here to show you what they are and try to make it more uh, specific for why it should matter to you. Now, accessibility has always been very important, but in the current climate where we are teaching predominantly exclusively online, ensuring the equitable access to our learning environment has never been more important. Last year, I gave a talk along with Esther Munoz from eLearning Media and my colleague Sam Cole, and this presentation builds on that. I thought it'd be nice to just reflect on last year's talk and talk about how we've built on that in lead up to producing this talk. Of course, we've recently had a number of new accessibility regulations and rules introduced, not just in Europe, but there is a global momentum uh, towards accessibility and towards the legal enforcement of accessibility. And often we read secondary or tertiary guides which don't always make it clear how the different parts of the regulations and rules really interrelate with each other. And in my opinion, we need to look at some of the primary legislation and regulations to really understand the detail. And I'm gonna take you through some of that in this presentation. And then I'm going to demonstrate how, through my customization of the Blackboard theme, I've taken on board some of the uh, guidelines from the World Wide Web Consortium that are used as part of the EU-based regulations in terms of my customization of the Blackboard theme. And the main areas that I'm going to look at are the use of colour, colour contrast, focus indicators, movement, and also look at how our customizations of the theme can improve usability. Now, it's a lot to go through, and when I'm giving the presentation in um, live, it will be a 10-minute version. So this is designed to be the full-length director's cut. All the extra materials are in here, and I hope that you find it useful. Now, in terms of what's in scope, we're looking at the Blackboard original experience. And if you're using the original experience, you're likely to be using the 2016 or 2012 theme. And you might have customised it, or you may not have customised it. This presentation is more relevant if you have customised or you're interested in customising your theme. However, a lot of the aspects that I'll demonstrate will be of interest to you, even if you have not customised the theme. What's out of scope is Blackboard Ultra and the Ultra base navigation, and also the materials that are uploaded to Blackboard by your staff and students. So we're just looking at the user interface, uh, what we call the theme. And because this builds on my previous presentation, along with Esther and Sam, about which we call the Bluffer's Guide to customizing the Blackboard theme, I'm going to assume that you've either watched it or you're going to watch it because all of the materials that we have in that presentation are the building blocks on which the materials in this presentation will make more sense. I'm also assuming that you have administrator access to your environment, your Blackboard environment, or you have a colleague or someone in another department who does who you'll be working with. Even if you don't, a lot of this will be of interest and relevance to you if you use Blackboard. And of course, if you do implement anything that I show you, I'm going to be assuming that you're going to test 
in a development or pre-production environment before you make anything live. What I don't assume is that you would have any expertise in custom style sheets. That's the language that we use to customize the theme. In our previous presentation, we showed how you could go from a bluffer to an innovator in terms of your knowledge and use of custom style sheets. I also won't assume that you're an expert in accessibility. I can't say that I'm an expert myself. We're all at different stages of learning on this journey. And I imagine this presentation may end up being quite long. Uh, I've got 178 slides. So I'm not going to assume that you're going to watch the whole presentation. When I upload this to YouTube, I'm going to add uh, shortcuts or a table of contents to different parts of the presentation. So you may well want to watch the whole thing or zero in on something that's of particular interest. And hopefully this will be a resource that you can go back to over time. You might have seen a presentation that I gave at the Blackboard Mobile and Collaborate uh, user group session at the Durham conference. And this presentation is based on that. You've already seen that presentation. Why, why should you look at this one? Well, I've added more content. I've also made sure it's up to date, including the latest details about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.2 first draft of which was released in February. Some of the feedback I had was that because I had a 20 minute uh, slot, I did kind of rush through the material and I'm gonna take the time to hopefully, hopefully give you more time to absorb this as I go. Now I'm aware this also might make this presentation seem a bit slow, but in YouTube, you can speed up the video, so hopefully, you will find a, a speed at which it works for you. And wherever I give examples of how we have configured our theme at the University of Southampton, I will include the code. So you can copy and paste this into Stylus, for example, to test this in your own environment as you build your theme. So everything that I'm going to be showing you, I'm including the code that uh, creates this within the presentation. So you'd be able to copy and paste it and play around with it in Stylus. If you don't know what Stylus is, you definitely need to watch our presentation from last year. I have built, or in fact, I'm still building a supporting website. So although we have a fantastic ultra course to support the conference and all of our um, materials and presentations, and I will be placing links to this on the ultra site. I also found it's easier for me to keep everything in one place. And I've included the presentations that I gave at previous TLCs, as well as um, links to this presentation. And I'm also giving another presentation, which I still haven't finished writing, um, about how you can create better Blackboard help right where your users need it when they are going to want to use it, which I'm really excited about and I hope you take a look at as well. And the web address for that is go.sotton.ac.uk slash bb, same as last year. And in the supporting website for this presentation, I've added in all of the links to things that I refer to. So although the links are also within this presentation, I'm trying to make it easier for you by putting those links into this web page as well so that you can access them. It's possible I might have missed something, but the beauty of this is it's a very simple uh, website. It's nothing flashy, and I can easily add to that based on feedback. So if you don't know me, my name is Matthew Deeprose, and I'm using the Twitter handle VLE Guru. And I've been managing the Blackboard service at the University of Southampton since July 2000. So I'm approaching my 20th year with Blackboard. And yes, when I started, I did have hair. Um, I'm also a Blackboard MVP. That's the most valuable player. Although I have to say, I learn so much from everyone in the Blackboard community site. And you might have seen my previous presentations, uh, Upgrade Club, back in, uh, was that Manchester at the TLC? And then last year, um, with Esther and Sam, we gave the, the Bluffers Guide. 
And this year, I'm giving this presentation about Blackboard Theme Accessibility and Better Blackboard Help. Now you might think, uh, where is Southampton? And I often try to explain where it is. And I thought, since this is a kind of long form presentation, I could try and show everyone exactly where it is. So it's in the south of the United Kingdom. Uh, and here, as we zoom in, you can see right where it is, right at the bottom of the UK and um, quite close to the Isle of Wight, which you can see at the bottom there. So the main area of Southampton is highlighted uh, with that little red. This is all courtesy of Google Maps. And um, my top or a top fact about Southampton is Southampton water has the benefit of a double high tide. So two high tide peaks. And we have a large um, shipping container port as well as a cruise ship port in Southampton. And having two high tides helps ships or large ships in particular to be able to get to the port. I actually live very, very close to the, uh, the port and often I can hear the containers being picked up and sometimes dropped by the cranes nearby and you can hear a crazy rumble. Although something I find quite uh, fascinating, um, container ships and ports like that. Um, but now I'm going to start to ramble. So let's carry on and looking more seriously at the presentation because right now, the world is really quite a different place from how we imagined it being. In some ways, many things are still very similar. In some ways, things have changed quite a dramatic amount in just a small number of months. And I've noticed this phrase used quite a lot, equitable access. We're using this in terms of accessibility. But also, um, something that's a hot topic at the moment is whether the learning and delivery that we're doing on Blackboard and other related systems, whether we should be focusing on synchronous or asynchronous. It's asynchronous a little more equitable that people from different time zones and different levels of internet usage can access. But the accessibility of our environments has really never been more important. I've just picked out a few items from the news. This one is more about uh, schools, but I know that many of us have children who we are educating at home. And if you have children and you're teaching them at home at the moment, you might also have noticed some accessibility issues uh, in terms of accessing the learning materials. And just as relevant for our university students. Also, the accessibility of important information to visually impaired people is vital that we make sure that that is equally accessible to everyone, because it's so important at the moment. And how we deal with accessibility and make sure that we're enabling equitable access to our resources is something that's really going to think, I think, and this article also shows, it's really going to stand out and could, it will certainly be a differentiator for those who have not made uh, their resources accessible. I think, uh, whenever things change again, there will be a lot of lessons from this period of time. And of course, uh, accessibility is very important and very current. And these articles are just kind of, you can follow the links online on the uh, support site. Uh, some good background reading that I thought really um, makes important the, the nature of the material that we're gonna be going through. Now, last year, we were giving our, our lightning talk an hour, but it was really based on the feedback from the community and working on the community because Sam and I were brand new to um, learning CSS. We got so much from the Blackboard community, the Blackboard community site, and from Esther in particular. And that's uh, the really great that we were able to bring everything together into this uh, presentation. Now, um, the video is on YouTube. The video has about 20 minutes of bonus material and I painstakingly did the subtitles for that hour long video as well. Unfortunately, with the move of the Blackboard community site, some of the links no longer work. Uh, Nathan Cobb from Blackboard 
has been working really hard trying to scrape things back together for me, which I've not yet been able to look at. Techniques and tips from that presentation are particularly useful. So if you haven't watched it and you're interested in customizing your theme, I really recommend it. And things I'm still using are the Stylus plugin for um, Chrome or Firefox, and of course, Inspect Element, because a lot of the Blackboard theme is not particularly documented. So with these tools, you can work out what's going on and experiment very quickly. And these are fantastic tools, which I'll explain in the talk. And um, since then, since we gave that presentation, um, I've done a lot of development and I've been learning lots more CSS and I found with a lot of things I needed to learn JavaScript. So I've been learning JavaScript as well. Although I'm using many online resources, I had to recommend five, these five websites here in particular recommend. And we're now up to about 1700 lines of customized CSS in our theme. And I recently produced a blog post on the Blackboard community site um, called Let Me Show You My Blackboard based on Chris Boone's uh, long running thread of showing us your Blackboard, where I have gathered screenshots and examples of some of the customizations that I've been doing in the past year. If you've not seen that, I recommend that you take a look. So let's continue. Um, now it's important to note that although I'm going to be talking about some legal topics, this is not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer, however I've read a lot of this material. It might be that I've misunderstood something. And as I said earlier, we're all at different stages on this journey of learning. And I, knew, I learn new things every day, as I'm sure you do as well, and particularly in this area, which is quite fast moving, as I will hopefully demonstrate to you as we go through this presentation. So you might have heard of the public sector web uh, accessibility regulations, but how are they related to each other? There is a European Union directive and all of the member states of the EU have had to implement this into their law. So in the UK, we have the uh, public sector bodies, accessibilities regulations, and I've added here some examples from the transposition, as it is known, into the laws of the other European members. And as well as what I show you here, of course, there's 23 more. When you read these uh, regulations, which I particularly recommend, the UK version is five pages long, but I would not say that it was particularly readable. In fact, you notice the number two it had in the name. It had to be redrafted because there were so many uh, drafting errors in the first version. But the European version, while it's 30 pages long, I found it to be eminently readable. And um, actually my passion for accessibility increased having read this, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. In terms of the UK regulations now, I appreciate this is the European conference, but this, because I've been looking at this through the UK implementation, uh, I have a bit more detail about this. I have to say that I've not read the transpositions of these regulations in the, into the 27 other countries' uh, laws. But you also need to be aware of in the UK, the Equality Act, which does not actually apply in Northern Ireland. Um, and then the Disability Discrimination Act, which applies to all of the UK, because there are terms such as the failure to make a reasonable adjustment, which are mentioned in the UK based regulations, but which are defined and determined in these other two acts. The European regulations or the, this directive, they refer back to earlier communications where you can see this was a whole strategy for enabling greater accessibility and also uh, enabling the digital agenda across Europe, which has been running for uh, quite a long time. And this is why I found as you read this, you find that actually this is all part, quite a long running theme, as you would imagine, really. Of course, we want everything to be more accessible. We want to include, improve the equality for everyone. But when you start reading and 
this. And then the European Directive also refers to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities from the United Nations. It's, it's all part of one uh, big global direction. In terms of the standards that we should follow, both the UK-based regulations or the, the statutory instrument and the directive refer to two um, two items, a, a regulation, that's uh, 1025 2012, and the standard EN 301549. They effectively say everything that uh, you need to follow is in either of these documents, and particularly everything is going to that we're going to be looking at is in standard EN 301549. I'll be telling you much more about shortly. Now that is based on the World Wide Web Consortium. That's what W3C means. Their Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Originally, these standards, the European standard, referred, referred to the Web Content Accessibility Guideline, which I will now start calling WCAG. Um, level 2.0, but has since been updated to level 2.1. Level 2.2 is on its way. And there are a number of uh, variants within there which have also levels A, double A or triple A, a bit like ratings agency. Triple A is the best, then double A and then A. A is kind of like the minimum standard and AA is also a minimum standard for, for many of these areas. And, and that's what the European standard refers to. But it's the European standard which is written into the law. And that's why I'm focusing on uh, the European standard, which I'll be telling you more about later. Now, WCAG has also informed other areas, such as uh, the ISO standard, and it's also referred to in the uh, Section 508, which our colleagues in America will be well aware of uh, in the education area in particular. You might also have heard of the Americans with Disabilities Act. This does not actually refer to WCAG. There isn't actually a defined standard in ADA, as far as I'm aware. The reason I mention that is You've probably heard, or you may have heard, of the case of Domino's Pizza, uh, which was in the news in America. It was almost a year ago. If you Google Domino's Ada, uh, you will find lots of interesting news. I thought it was important to put this into kind of the global context and show how these rules and regulations uh, apply. And it's not only these, but around the world, there is a global momentum toward greater accessibility. These are just a few that I have uh, listed. Speaking of that global momentum, where we have this current European directive, which is about public sector bodies, coming along is the European Accessibility Act, which will be taking effect from 2025. And it covers more areas, more within the private sector. And uh, Within this list, you can see some of the areas that that's going to apply to. Another sign of this global movement and that the, the level is, is increasing. And so what's, um, what's standard today might not be good enough uh, in a few years time. And also on that topic, the, uh, the European standards, they actually, there is a whole long set and chapters 9, 10 and 11 are relevant to the regulations. These standards are being updated. They've most recently been updated toward the end of last year. Now refer to uh, CAG 2.1. And this is a screenshot. There's this website called etsy.org where you can um, get the latest drafts and versions of these standards. And you can see they are being updated so far, or well, at least the past two years, 2018 and 2019. They have been updated. I did contact the EU. I found what I thought was the right address. And I asked, so um, there's one main site and then there's, which has, which is called Mandate. And then there's another site, Etsy, which has the latest versions. How will we know when the latest versions of these standards become like the accepted ones, which will be kind of 
what we need to follow. I'm afraid their answer didn't really mean much to me. I'm not sure whether they just didn't answer my question, whether I got a kind of pro forma, but I thought I would, since I went to the effort of contacting them to try and find out, I, uh, this is the full uh, reply that I got. But if uh, you have any colleagues who are experts in European laws and standards, I would love to find out a bit more about this uh, because um, when you go to the actual uh, the mandate site, this is what you see. And you can see also that sections 9, 10 and 11 are referred to in the standards. So it's not just web pages, also non-web documents and software as well. Of course, in terms of Blackboard, we're just going to be talking about uh, web pages, the web interface. Another part of this global momentum is I mentioned WCAG and that 2.2 is coming along. It's due to be released in November, but the first public working draft was released this February. And there's something very relevant to us, which I will tell you more about uh, later on. And it continues to move forward. In 2022, they're looking to have the next generation of standards, which is called Project AG, being worked on by Task Force Silver. Silver because of um, silver is AG in the periodic table. And from what I've read so far, in this next generation, they won't have levels A, AA and AAA. Now, in terms of how can we comply with these regulations, in a way, you can break it down to four steps. You need to understand the regulations and how they're going to impact your institution. Check the accessibility of your websites, and this will include when you make changes, such as updating your Blackboard theme, and then making a plan to fix any issues you find, but also as you make changes, making sure that those changes are accessible, and of course, publishing an accessibility statement. This information is from uh, a government website from the Government Digital Service. Um, we have a thread on the community site, show us your accessibility statement where we've been sharing what we've been working on so far. Hasn't been updated that much lately, but I'm hoping that as uh, everyone looks at each other's work that we are sharing within this TLC conference, that that will continue to, to build. I'm not going to go into detail here, but you might wish to go back and look over this in the slides. I've kind of tried to break down from my reading, what needs to be done and when as we go through um, these, uh, these regulations and as different deadlines are reached. But the, the kind of what we uh, are mainly thinking of in terms of Blackboard is that it is an extranet or an intranet and uh, content on it and the interface of it is within the scope of these regulations. You may hear the phrase or the words accessibility, usability and inclusivity used almost interchangeably. And I'm not going to go into the differences uh, between them because that probably would be another talk, but two quotes that or I thought were particularly relevant. First of all, this is quite a famous uh, kind of text from uh, the usability area, don't make me think. Um, Say the website is not usable unless it is accessible. So we need to think about the accessibility first before we can really consider usability. The accessibility comes first because our website is not usable unless it is accessible. And in terms of inclusivity, the business case for digital accessibility on the uh, World Wide Web Consortium's website states so, which is quite obvious really, but Throughout our, our lives, as we go through different points, uh, we will benefit from accessible features and designs. And um, Microsoft did a really nice um, website, or well, Microsoft Design did, about accessibility and inclusivity, which you'll find a link to on the support page for this presentation. That impairments, while we often think of permanent impairments, like being uh, blind or deaf, you might have a temporary impairment or a situational impairment. So now we're going to actually start focusing on Blackboard and the Blackboard theme. 
We introduced the 2016 responsive theme in 2019, and when we implemented it, we wanted to be both on brand institutionally, so using the colours that our communications and marketing teams have spent much time deciding uh, uh, these colours are what um, what uh, differentiates the University of Southampton, and this is part of our, our culture and what these colours represent. Um, and also, of course, we had these uh, new web accessibility regulations and making sure that when we made these changes that we weren't making anything worse. Now, this is how our Blackboard used to look, the 2012 theme. And this is how our Blackboard currently looks with the 2016 theme. We want to make sure that when we make changes that we're not doing anything that would make accessibility worse. And so the priority is on making sure that the changes we make remain accessible. And I'll be showing you ways that I believe we've improved the accessibility of the Blackboard user interface. And just one final shout out. If you've not watched our presentation from last year, just get on YouTube and take a look because everything that I'm referring to today is kind of building on uh, what I've shared in last year's presentation on with Esther and Sam. So um, next we're going to start looking at approaches to actually uh, ensuring when you customize your theme that it is accessible, that it is complying with web accessibility guidelines and the European web accessibility standard. And the first, probably the most important area to look at is color and contrast. Now, Think of this in, in context, and some of this data is from the UK because it's easier for me to, to find, but I'm sure it's not particularly different uh, elsewhere, at least in Europe anyway. So more than 2 million people in the UK have a visual impairment. Many more report having difficulties with their sight, because of course we might have temporary and situational impairments. Almost 5% of the population are colorblind, and... Uh, Red, green color blindness can affect up to 8% of males and a much smaller percentage of females of North European descent, according to Wikipedia. But also the ability to see and be able to differentiate color decreases as we age. And speaking of the situational impairments, who hasn't used a phone in a bright light and been squinting at it, trying to work out uh, what they're looking at? And probably even more particularly in an educational environment, how many times have you been in a room where you were a projector, projecting some content, maybe not a great projector, maybe the blinds uh, weren't drawn or the lights were on and you really couldn't make out particularly well uh, what you were seeing. So these are examples of situational impairments that affect anyone and it's why using colour and contrast in an accessible way is so important. And let's have a look now in the standards, how it refers to uh, color and contrast and how we relate that to our Blackboard theme. Now, something that's very important, but not necessarily relevant to the Blackboard theme is that color should not be used as the only means of conveying information. I'll tell you what you can see on the slide here, Got a reference to in the European standard what the number and the language is. So you can see that it's 9.2.10 and it refers to the WCAG 2.0 standard. That's in the published area on mandate free sentences.standards.eu. And you can see here we have four boxes. The green and red, you might assume green means okay and red means uh, something bad. Like green might mean confirm and red might mean cancel or red might mean delete and green might mean go. But without um, something extra, you don't really know uh, what, what it's trying to tell you. And if you're colorblind, with red-green colorblindness being the most prevalent form of colorblindness, really needs to be able to convey that information, not just with color. So in this example, we have a tick and a cross. There's also a cultural area to consider. Well, in uh, Europe, we might tend to think that red is something bad, green something good. We have traffic lights, red for stop, green for go. In other cultures, 
Um, red might not be bad. Uh, a colleague from China was telling me that red is considered something very good in China, in Chinese culture, at least in some areas of China, whereas white is the colour of something which is banned. Although apparently the traffic lights are uh, red, amber, green in China as well. But we shouldn't use colour as the only means of conveying information. I don't think really that particularly applies within Blackboard, but it is important to be aware of. However, what we think of contrast, so the contrast of one colour to the colour next to it, that is important. And there's something uh, called non-text contrast. So that's where you have graphical objects, might be diagrams and user interface components like icons. And the regulation says that there should be a contrast ratio greater than three to one. Now I'll explain a bit more about contrast ratios in a moment. For now I'm gonna be showing you what these look like. So uh, in this graphical object, this diagram, it's the contrast between the black color on the outer line of the circles and making the, uh, I guess these are kind of brands of social media companies. That they contrast at least with a ratio of three to one with the other colors that you can see there. And for icons, that's the, the same. And I've put up or copy and pasted the, uh, the, the language that uh, uses there. Now in Blackboard, for example, here we have the buttons that appear above the course menu. Now this is one of the colors from our university color scheme, uh, but that actually has a contrast ratio of 1.87 to one, which is bad. So currently we're using this shade of blue. We have many shades of blue in our uh, university brand. Uh, this has a much higher ratio, higher than three to one. So that's a tick. I'll be demonstrating the code uh, here and you can paste that into someone like Stylus to use to experiment with. And it's very easy to change these colors in Stylus and see how it would look with your um, your institutional colors if you're customizing your theme. Now further on, earlier we were just looking at graphics and icons, but what about text? So the AA standard, which is our minimum standard in the regulations, is that text should have a contrast ratio of at least four and a half to one, so that's higher. There are some exceptions, like large text, if I remember right, it's something like uh, if it's 18 points or higher or 14 points in bold, it could have a slightly lower contrast ratio. Also, incidental text, which is kind of inactive or it's just decoration, and you can see a few other examples here, that's also excluded. And logos, so if you have a logo or a brand name, that uh, does not need by these regulations uh, to have sufficient contrast. And there's also a triple A level. This is in WCAG, not in the European standard. Now to show you what we mean, you might think this is a button, isn't it? This is an icon, but it's got letters in it. So it's actually, it's the visual presentation of text or it could be an image of text. So we need to have at least 4.5 to one, ideally above seven to one. So we're using uh, this darker blue, one of our many shades of blue, which has a, a very high contrast ratio. And this is the CSS code, which uh, covers the uh, at least the color elements of this, uh, this button. If you're looking for a handy guide, three to one is at the minimum for graphics, 4.5 to one is the minimum for text, and seven to one and higher is the enhanced level. I don't think we should be aiming to meet the minimum. If we If it has to be the minimum, that's fine, but we probably should be aiming for the enhanced level, it's a bit more future proof. How do you actually check the contrast between two colors? Well, it involves determining the relative luminance of two colors and then comparing the luminance of the foreground and background color. But well, I found some great pages, which you'll find links here, which explain it. This is what the algorithm looks like. Most of us will not get out a pen and paper and work this out ourselves. We might use an online color contrast check. And I'm going to tell you about a few different ones. 
And Web Aim, it's a fantastic resource, great website. They have a color contrast checker. But this one has an API and you can uh, use curl to send um, a string with uh, two HTML colors and it will send you back a JSON, if that means anything to you, with the ratio and various other bits of information. And this is the only one that I found that does this. And so if you are a developer, I particularly recommend checking out their API. I believe there are other similar ones, but this is the one that I found first and I've used this myself uh, quite a bit. Another one that you might uh, find particularly useful, this site, Accessible Colors, you can put in two colors, it will tell you the contrast between them, but it will also suggest how to change that color to make it meet the required contrast ratio. So if you knew I've got two colors and I really, I have to have something, and if it's not exactly on brand, I can adjust it and it will be, it, that's acceptable. Then this will show you how to make a more acceptable version, a compliant version of a color. And since last year, uh, in both Firefox and Chrome, you'll find that within Inspect Element, it will also tell you, um, sometimes, not always, but it will often tell you the contrast ratio of uh, two colors. So that can be particularly useful when you're customizing your theme. My favorite uh, color contrast checker is called whocanuse.com. That's created by Corey Ginnivan who's based in Perth in Australia. Why I particularly like this one is not only does it tell you the contrast ratio, whether it would pass or fail uh, the WCAG standard, it also explains how those that color contrast and in some case demonstrates how it would look if you have a different uh, numbers of different uh, vision impairments. And it also has some examples of situational impairments, like the direct sunlight that I mentioned before. Of course, it tells you when things are, are looking good. You could also get tools which will automate color contrast checking on the web. There are many available, but uh, what I particularly like is this uh, Accessibility Insights from Microsoft. It's very quick and easy to install in, in your browser, and it will do a fast pass to run a quick check to identify issues. And that includes color contrast. Now, this isn't really something that you can use to automatically go through the entire site because you just check one page at a time. But for you, as someone who's, say, responsible for or supporting a Blackboard environment or for developers, I think this is a great tool for doing quick checks. I found all kinds of issues uh, with this that I hadn't considered before. So I really recommend checking that out. I also find that the more you get into this, you will start to see color contrast issues everywhere. Now, as well as doing calculations or using an online tool to check color contrast one at a time, and this, for example, is our color palette. You can see all of those blues in, in the middle there. And um, we're having to look up certain color combinations often. And then I was trying to explain the importance of this to colleagues with uh, other services. And a lot of people started saying, well, have you got a way to just to, to make it easier to know which color con combinations we can use? And after some thought and discussion, I came up with this matrix where we have all of the colors in our brand uh, along the top and along the side. And you can see where two colors correspond, uh, you'll have a rating. And F means it fails. It shouldn't be used for anything. A G means it's okay for graphics, but not for text. AA, of course, means it's okay for text at the minimum level. And triple A is the enhanced level. Of course, if you're creating graphical objects, you don't have to stick with the G's, you can use the, the double A's or the triple A's as well. So not only did I create this, I made a script which actually uses the WebAIM API. So you can feed in uh, uh, your range of HTML colors and it will create something, it doesn't look quite as fancy as this, it'll create a CSV file, 
which then I just tidy up in Excel by adding uh, the colors and so on. And I was quite happy with myself for doing that. But then when I was looking through the Blackboard template, um, so if you've not given a presentation at a TLC before, Blackboard provide a really brilliant uh, PowerPoint template. And they include this color chart showing of the colors which they prefer you to use within the presentation, which ones are accessible uh, at different sizes of font. So it might be that I actually got the idea from them. So thanks, Blackboard. <laughs> Once I produced that matrix, I then got some further feedback. People said, oh, but it's, so, it's all right as far as it goes, seeing it in the matrix, but I'd like to see how it looks. So I developed the script to then produce a number of web pages that demonstrate um, for all of those color combinations, how they look, either as graphics or as text. And if you would find that useful for your institution, I hit me up on LinkedIn. Maybe I could uh, get your color codes to just feed into my scripts and make this for you as well. Now, I mentioned the next generation of accessibility guidelines. There will be a new method of testing color contrast. There's actually quite a lot of heated discussion about some perceived failings with the calculation that had is currently being used for testing color contrast. And if you're interested in this, there is a very long discussion for it, which actually is incredibly interesting, uh, talking about the benefits of different uh, methods. Um, so that's all right as far as it goes, but once you start looking into the detail of implementing this in your Blackboard theme, there are areas of complexity that you might not consider at first. So there's the next part of the presentation. I'm going to try and highlight where some of that complexity is. So when we're using uh, boxes, for example, in a content area, we're using the build content or assessments or the tools button. When we hover over that button of our mouse, it changes. And likewise, when we uh, we wanted to use our institutional colors for both the hover as well as the normal states. So you have to consider that as well. And here as an example is where we added uh, colors for when we hover to keep it remaining on brand as well as highly accessible. You can see those values are at the enhanced level and we've added the CSS there for you. Now, if you've not covered or looked at hover before you probably you know what it is instinctively because when you move a mouse over an area on a web page when you hover the pointer over something something changes that's called a hover and I've got some links here so you can do some reading up if you like but in that example css you can see that a means a link and so we're saying when we're hovering on a link we want to make the color green and you can also do quite a number of other things. And so in this example, we're going to have an underline and an overline. And you can do quite a few other uh, quite cool things. Uh, if we continue looking at hover states. We've also got when we're in the uh, control panel. And in this example, not only when we hover, but we've expanded users and groups. And that takes a uh, color to show that it's expanded. And then we're hovering as well. So we've really got to think about all of these areas and here is you can see there's more and more code to to look at even more complex is what's called button four in blackboard is a go button but it can also be a cancel button and that go button it will appear in um, different places and the background color around that button might also be different so the color that you have to choose it's going to have to look OK, but also be accessible in all of the different contexts in which it will appear. So I guess the lesson here is testing, 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 testing. Uh, hopefully by now you can see that where we've got this uh, slide from a Blackboard roadmap uh, showing the grade center improvements. On the mobile screen, you can see the red row the black text at the beginning might be blue. It's almost unreadable. So um, even the best of us are still making uh, some misfortunate choices when we're enabling new features in an environment. So we need to be quite vigilant 
and keeping an eye on these things for all of us. Now, going back, just reviewing, in summary, as you're building your theme, you should be considering colour contrast from the start. I have to say, when we started uh, customising our theme, we were more just basing it on what we thought looked good. And then as I started to understand the accessibility requirement, then I had to go back and make a few changes here and there to make sure that the contrast was uh, at the right level. But as you do so, you are quite empowered to make sure that your environment is on brand, that uh, your Blackboard is congruent with your other services so that the students and staff, they don't feel, oh, I feel completely different. Does, is this even a university service because it looks so different? Like, that it uh, is consistent with our portal and our other services and making sure that the contrast is appropriate I even found that some of the colours that Blackboard had used did not have sufficient contrast and I've reported all of those occurrences. That's in the, in the default 2016 theme, reported all of those to Blackboard support. Even if you're thinking, actually, this all looks like a lot of work, I don't think I uh, want to. Is it really worth the effort? Well, take a look at my blog post uh, where I show you some of the things I've set up in our environment. And I think it really is worth the effort. From time to time when I need to go back to 2016 theme just to prove that something's working in a certain way and it's not a, a result of a change I've made. It, uh, there are a lot of things I do not like about the 2016 theme that um, I'm very glad not to be inflicting those on our users. These uh, course menus are from back in the day and you can straight away see some quite poor accessibility choices and some of these uh, colours here. Since the 2018 Q2 release, the responsive theme still allows uh, instructors to change their course colours and that's something that they, they really like and that's what we were waiting for before we implemented the 2016 theme. So we reset uh, our, all of our courses to a new default accessible uh, colour uh, scheme and the code for that by the way there's some sequel that we used to do that that's in the extended version of the presentation from last year if you're interested and um, but still our instructors do like changing their course menu colors uh, but they might not make accessible choices so so what can we do if our instructors make poor quality uh, choices or color schemes now, I don't think I've seen anything quite this bad, but I have seen some quite bad choices. So what can we do about that? Well, we could uh, use course templates. Unless we stop staff from being able to change their course mini colors, they could still change them afterwards. And we've also found when you roll over a course uh, into a new course, if the new course was made with a template, but the old course wasn't, the colours of the old course, depending on what you select when you use course copy, will be copied over. So how can we enforce that up if even if we don't want to stop customization of colour schemes? And I'll show you a few things that we've done uh, at Southampton to kind of account for this. And I should also say, you might remember that the subheader in the 2016 theme is a fixed color. I believe that this is being changed this year, finally going to be fixed. But uh, one of the, I think this is probably pretty much the first thing on uh, Kevin O'Connor's fantastic um, list of 2016 theme community fixes was how to change the color of the subheader. So the default was white and you could not change it. And the current fix is we fix it to a certain color in the CSS and we've chosen to make it black. If a different uh, background color was used, the instructor could change the text in this case to white, but they can't change that subheader. So that's another aspect that we wanted to kind of find uh, a way around this. So just to make an improvement. And um, what I'm quite excited about is um, we had a request from our arts and humanities faculty. They wanted to have uh, consistent menu colors across subject areas. They wanted archeology span to be a kind of a brown color. 
I don't remember any particular preferences for different subject areas. Just remember archaeology were up for ground. They're also thinking of having, um, as you went through a, a first year course to a second year course to a third year course, that the colour might either darken or lighten as you as you go. And but how could we enforce the uh, colour scheme? Bearing in mind some of the issues with uh, using course templates and of course with subheaders. So came up with something quite ingenious using a JS hack where for certain courses an extra CSS file is loaded which affects the course menu. Now I'm going to show you this. So first of all I added a, something that blocks the ability to change menu colors. So this uh, sets that menu design element to display none meaning that uh, the staff won't be able to make this change. And then the other details are the, the other, these are all of the aspects that I found that were required to set the Blackboard menu color scheme. You could use this and change these colors because you can see there's just a small number of colors and you could use this to, to suit your own purposes. But how do we make that work just for a certain uh, number of courses? So I'm going to show you the JS hack itself. First of all, within the snippet, we upload and attach to the hack a special CSS file. In this case, it's the archaeology template. So this is my testing file, the CSS. I actually made this live yet because we were, this is one of our main projects. It was going to be for um, the spring, but then uh, the world has changed since then. It's kind of slightly on the back burner, but I'm really happy to have uh, got this uh, solution. So. Injecting at the learning system page point, uh, it's loading that CSS. But this clever bit is you can use an advanced expression and say, because all of our course IDs, I'm sure it's the same for you, follow a certain standard. Um, anything that has arch in it should apply the CSS. So all archaeology courses will have the CSS applied and, um, that way they will get the color scheme without us having to faff around with templates and user education. We can just, can just load this up and it's there. It's on all courses, old ones, new ones. Don't have to do anything. Quite happy with that. And I'll be developing some of these techniques I show here in my better Blackboard help presentation, which I really recommend checking out. I think uh, I'm really quite excited about that. I just need to finish making the presentation. So what else can we do? Uh, I added a, as a kind of coping mechanism that if you use focus, I'll tell you more about focus in shortly, but in brief, it's when you um, use the tab key to move within a, a web page. And this is what you use, you tend to use if uh, you don't want to or are unable to use the mouse. Of course, the, I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. But what it does is it changes the background color of the menu item to white and sets the text color to black and bold. And that way, as you navigate the menu, it makes it easier to read the text because it has, you can't get much better contrast than black and white. And as an example, you can see here, I have it uh, changing when I hover with the mouse. And then next, if I use the tab key to uh, make my way through the menu, it's also changing. And we included that in our accessibility stain as a kind of coping strategy. Because we, we didn't want to stop uh, instructors from being able to change their color schemes of their menus, unless that was a departmental or faculty policy. But uh, until we come up with something better, this is our coping mechanism. I would be very interested to talk with any developers who might uh, be interested in working on a, a JS hack where when you're configuring color options for a course menu, it could take the two colors that you select, send them to the WebAIM API to get the contrast ratio, and then report on what the ratio is and perhaps disable the submit button until you've set some colors which have a at least 4.5 level of contrast. Not something, I'm still learning JavaScript. It's not something I've reached the 
it's not at my level of ability yet. Um, but that is my kind of next idea on how to cope with, uh, with this. So I mentioned focus indicators, and this is what the next section of our presentation is going to cover. A focus indicator is what is referred to as the part which we use to uh, identify which element of a page we're on. So usually we're making our way around the web page using keyboard navigation. We use the tab key to move around elements or shift tab to go backwards. To select an item or a link, we would press enter. Use a button, we'd use enter or a space bar. We can use the space bar to check or uncheck tick boxes and so on. And we can also use the cursor keys to move around radio buttons. I've got a link there of where that is explained. Now, if you're still not quite sure what I'm talking about, you probably will have used Google and you can do this yourself. When you go to Google, the area you can access first is the text box. You don't have to click into it. It's just selected ready for you. You press tab again it will select a search by voice. And in this time, it gets a little kind of a tooltip uh, telling you that that's selected. Then it uh, says it's the Google search box, which is selected, that blue around the button. And then I'm feeling lucky. It's not only used for keyboard navigation. The This uh, kind of uh, paradigm of Focusing on different elements and being able to select them is used for other assistive technologies. And you'll also find it's being used by screen readers. But also, power users love keyboard shortcuts. And I'm sure there are many of you who often find it faster to use the keyboard than using the mouse. So focus indicators and using focuses, again, might be uh, that you use that because of a temporary or situational impairment. And there are other examples of uh, situational impairments I was thinking of. That's a time where using a keyboard instead would be, uh, might be better, uh, you might prefer that than using a device that you're not comfortable with using. Likewise, you could be in a cramped space or for some reason you need to use the device and you've only got one hand available. So, in terms of the CSS, I mentioned hover before. Focus is, uh, well, apparently is a pseudo class. In the example at the top right here, we can see A is the link. And we're saying when you're focusing on it, we want the outline around that element to be three pixels, a solid line and orange color. So that's just an example of how we do focus. So in Blackboard, the, um, the focus styles and the default theme are very accessible. And how does that apply to the regulations? Well, in the European standard, the focus indicator has to be visible. Furthermore, in WCAG 2.1, they say that the focus indicator should have sufficient contrast so that you can you can see it and if the state relies on a change of color that you've got to consider the contrast as well in the draft of WCAG 2.2 there is a new uh, test for the focus visibility this is at the enhanced level uh, there's some details about the the size also about the color contrast and the, the thickness, at least three to one contrast ratio. And that is also mentioned in the WCAG 2.1, but in 2.2, it's much more explicit about it. Like I said, the Blackboard ones are fine, excellent. That's an enhanced level, greater than seven to one. But if we change the colors of our Blackboard theme to use our institutional brand, we need to consider the focus indicators as well. So let's take a look. Here I changed the background color of the, the, the top tabs area. So I need to make sure that the focus color is a brand color and also has sufficient contrast. And here you can see 
the code that I've listed here just is a is more than you need to do focus, but I wanted to show as well as an element of trying to make it easier. I don't think I ever saw anyone log out of Blackboard. The the default icon is this tiny little kind of power button icon. I never saw anyone notice it. And so I wanted to change it to say log out and to be big. And hopefully that will encourage people to actually use it. But I don't have any data to say how successful that is. But this is an example of the uh, focus indicator around that box. Also, the box changes color when I focus on it. And within the control panel, I change the color there. So I need to make sure that the color I use is both on brand and accessible. I've went through finding more and more uh, elements within the Blackboard theme where I could change the focus indicator. And I really wanted to make it large and identifiable. And um, so it tends to be three pixels wide and a two pixel offset, so the gap uh, around the, the element that I'm focusing on and really well contrasting color. Focus indicators, it doesn't have to be just a box. Um, you can have uh, other elements. This is just as some examples. So this is a little more abstracted the CSS. But here, instead of having a box around it, I'm changing the text to make it uppercase. Whether that would comply with CAG 2.2, I could say for the moment. I wonder if maybe it wouldn't. In this case, I both change the color and make the button larger. And here is a just a, a large uh, identifiable box. If you change your Blackboard theme to match your institutional brand, it's going to be almost inevitable that you have to deal with the focus indicators. Because it's quite unlikely that the purple color, which is standard used in the Blackboard interface in most cases, that that will be uh, have sufficient contrast with colors that are in within your institutional brand. As an example, our uh, course menus uh, were white and the default color for focus and hover in the Blackboard theme are purple, which is a very low uh, contrast ratio with white. So that's why I say it's, it's almost inevitable that you'd have to be looking at this. Because focus indicators are used when you click on items uh, within the interface, I also believe, I don't have any evidence for this, but I have in, had some informal uh, feedback from, from staff in particular, um, that it gives them the extra comfort of knowing, yes, I did click on it, because you can see that box around there. I'm not sure about at your institution, but when we receive tickets or Blackboard support, the majority are from staff rather than students. And I still encounter many staff uh, who find IT and computers, they still find it quite intimidating. So I do try to consider when I'm making adjustments and changes like this, something that can actually just make their use of Blackboard feel a bit, uh, a bit better to give them a bit more comfort that things have definitely been selected. But there are challenges because without full documentation for the theme, you need to be kind of, you need to work out a lot of this for yourself using good old inspect element. Now, unfortunately, the theme that I had shared last year uh got white with the move to the new version of the community site and i've been very busy making changes and doing lots of work and once i have tidied everything up and i'm happy with it i will share a new version and you'd be able to access then all of the work that i've done particularly on identifying focus indicators but uh that you have to admit that is a challenge but if we want to both customize our environment and ensure that it is accessible then this is something that we need to do. But the community is really good at working together. And like I say, I will be sharing some of that uh, theme work as soon as I have it all and uh, tidied up and, and ready uh, to do so.
it's not just focus that we need to consider. And I thought I'd just mention some related aspects that are within the regulations. This is directly referring to EN301549, that's the European regulation. It's something called no keyboard trap. So that is that a keyboard user can't get trapped within, for example, a modal or which is like a kind of a pop-up that takes over a box and that you, you have to be able to still use the keyboard in all aspects of the interface. You shouldn't be expected to have to find the mouse to get out of the system. Bypass blocks that keyboard users can uh, navigate sequentially through content and directly access primary content. So this, for example, is where we have a skip to content which is also within the uh, within Blackboard as well. And that the order when we're focusing uh, makes sense. And that uh, when we focus on an interface element, that it behaves predictably. And that the navigation is consistent. So that as we focus, the, the manner in which uh, we navigate a website doesn't keep changing and surprising us that as we do things repeatedly on the same website that elements of the interface of different pages will work in a consistent manner and that how we identify uh, elements within the user interface that that's consistent as well and uh, i want to mention particular focus order because as you're testing this you will find focus order uh, because it is the way in which as you move around a web interface with the tab key as I showed you with the Google homepage earlier on, that it is in a logical and consistent order. So you start, for example, in the most important place, in this case, the search box, and then you make your way around. And um, you can use the Accessibility Insights plugin that I mentioned before to test this yourself. This is our Blackboard login page. So obviously showing you go to the username box first, then the password, and then login, and so on. Now, I'm starting to reach the end, but I wanted to show you a few other things that we can uh, do in terms of accessibility. This might be a new concept to you, but it's something called reducing motion. So every operating system has something, a setting, that allows users to say they would prefer a reduced amount of motion on the screen. Could be that they might have a motion triggered vestibular spectrum disorder. So within CSS, there is a media query, which you might only have used media queries before when looking at uh, responsive aspects of, a, of an interface. But you can detect if someone has stated that they prefer to have reduced motion on screen. Well, how does this relate to uh, Blackboard? Well, at last year's conference, we're really pleased to show you um, our adjusted puller, based on some of Esther's work, that uh, when you click on to the puller, would you tap into it and use keyboard navigation, of course. We often had people, like they would use the uh, puller or resize and the menu would disappear and they wouldn't notice. And so we had the puller button flashing in red. Uh, so that people could more easily be reminded, oh, if I click on this or I tap it, it will bring back the menu. But um, what if you prefer reduced motion? Well, here is an example of where using the media query saying that a uh, user has a preference for reduced motion, then what we will do is we will stop the animation, which is a color pulse, on that puller button, we'll change it to zero seconds so it does not uh, pulse at all. And that is a nice example of reducing motion. And you can find more on this very uh, useful website. And also, uh, there's a fantastic blog post here specifically about reduced motion. And you can still use CSS to make things easier. And if it's easier, Maybe it's more usable, more accessible, more inclusive. And just as a small case study, in Chrome, in the Grade Center, there is no button to move up and down. This is so problematic uh, if you have a large number of users 
in the course. So you can actually use CSS to add buttons to move uh, the, the scroll bar up and down. So you can move run one row at a time. So the, the animation is repeating now. But um, I found this had really been problematic to me personally. I just could not see the reason why you would stop this. Um, as, as since the 2012 theme, so I'm very happy that uh, we could add these uh, buttons using CSS. And this was actually prompted by someone who asked on the community site whether it would be possible. And I, I started looking into it. Uh, I've read, I can't recall the name of the person who asked, but uh, once I found uh, a technique, I shared the CSS back on the community site. And here it is. So you can see this adds uh, buttons to the, the top and the bottom and also covers the hover elements. It's quite long because you've got to have a, an up button, a down button, a left button and a right button. We are reaching the end and my time is telling me we're about one and a half hours in to this presentation. So if you've been watching the whole thing. Uh, I'm very happy that you have done so. Thank you. Let's just go back and check how I covered everything that I said I would in this agenda. We looked at uh, why it's more important than ever to uh, make sure we have ensured equitable access to our learning environments. We reflected on last year's uh, presentation with Esther Munoz and Sam Cole that we gave at the Teaching and Learning Conference last year. I've explained various web accessibility rules and regulations and how they are interrelated. And I've looked specifically at areas of Blackboard theme customization, so the use of color, color contrast, focus indicators, movement and usability. To conclude, like I said, accessibility is a journey. And if you're like me, you'll find yourself always learning something new. There's always new developments and changes, changes to browsers, things we need to consider, changes to regulations. So I don't think we can ever rest on our laurels and say everything is, is done. It's, it's a continual process. There are still many benefits to customizing the Blackboard theme. Hopefully you'll agree with that, having seen some of the, uh, some of the elements that I've demonstrated today. From my experience, color contrast and focus, in, focus styles, focus indicators, are the most important things to consider in terms of uh, customizing the Blackboard theme and uh, making sure that it is accessible. Hopefully with the techniques and suggestions that I've shown today, you will start to feel confident to tackle this on your own theme, particularly using some of the examples of code that I've provided within the presentation. You can copy and paste those into Stylus Paste in your own colors from your own theme and start to see, uh, hopefully, uh, how to uh, improve the uh, color contrast accessibility within your interface and so on. And you will also have seen the ways that you can check your uh, contrast on, uh, using web-based tools such as whocanuse.com. I should say particular thanks to Nathan, who's provided a lot of support for us for our, our lightning talk last year and for getting me uh, the video from that and the uh, the files from the old community site. Chris Boone, my eternal thanks to for giving me uh, a lot of feedback about uh, the drafts of my proposals. That was very useful. Hervé and Andy for their assistance with organising the teaching and learning conference this year and the great support they've given to us as presenters. And a special particular thanks to Esther, who I've really learned so much from um, in terms of customizing the theme. Esther works for eLearning Media, who are, they provide some fantastic services. So uh, check them out if, uh, if you can. And uh, I will finish up. My time is telling me we're well past one and a half hours. So thank you for uh, your interest in accessibility and the Blackboard theme. You can post your comments and questions on the Ultra site, contact me on the community site or LinkedIn, and I look forward to seeing uh, what other people uh, have feedback of how they've dealt with accessibility within their Blackboard interface. And also if I've misunderstood something 
or made some mistakes or there's something that could be improved, do let me know. And uh, because like I say, it really is a journey. And I think we're all always progressing on the way to that journey. But for now, uh, stay safe. I really hope to meet everyone again at the TLC next year at, in Amsterdam. Uh, I think we should make it a massive blowout party and really, um, really enjoy, hopefully, uh, being together again. So see you later. Oh, and don't forget to check out my next presentation in a week or so's time, Better Blackboard Help, which I'm going to go and start creating next. Thank you very much. Take care and goodbye.